I'm coming to you through the YouTube this time. Um, last time we shot live in my classroom, and that was back in October, and I was introducing to you the, the uh, Life in a Jar play and the story of Irina Sindler. Today I'm going to kind of echo some of those same things. We're going to talk about the power of the individual person. We're going to talk about the power of action, but also the power of inaction. And when we think of Irina Sindler, and just to kind of go back and recap, this is a woman who was working in the Warsaw Ghetto during World War II, and she was a humanitarian worker. She would go in, and um, she was working some, some uh, disease control and so on. But she got to the point where she, because of what she was taught as a child, some of the lessons her parents had taught her, she wanted to rescue as many children from certain death as she could. And she, she put together a network of people. She put together a team um, and devised a plan to rescue children. And now this is risky. Um, risky, one, because if she's caught, um, she faces certain death. But at the same time, if there's a network of people who are rescuing children, and you want to find out who is in that network, what you're going to do is you're going to take the people, torture them, and then have them hopefully reveal names, and you can just eliminate the whole network. So to think about rescuing children, it's a noble idea. It's, it's, it's a great idea. But to put it into practice, then, is, is to risk your own life. But Irina was determined to do what she could, um, again, mainly because of what her father had taught her. And so she will go into families in the ghetto who have children, and she presents them with the idea that I can get your child out and your child will live, but you have to give up your child. So at this point in time, when you think about that story, you have several individual stories intersecting. You have Irina, who is wanting to rescue the children, but then you have these parents who are faced with giving up their children, very young children, and knowing that they will never see them again. These people also know that they will probably be killed, but that their children will live. So it's a very emotional story, um, both from the standpoint of Irina and also the parents. That network that we talked about a second ago, Irina and her helpers, that blossoms out because Irina will rescue 2,500 children. Where do you put them? How do you keep them safe? And so what she does is she makes contacts with uh, different monasteries, different church groups, she makes contacts with just foster families, people who will take these children in and raise them as their own until maybe one day they can be reunited with family members. So as you can see, the network of risk and the network of rescue increases. Those are stories of individual people making choices. Um, in a few minutes, you're going to watch a YouTube video from a friend of mine named Mark Gudgel. And Mark teaches English in Lincoln, Nebraska. And in it, he's going to refer to the Holocaust as the, the best documented, the, the, the largest amount of documents about any single historic event. And so when you think about all the stories coming out of the Holocaust, and you zero in on this story of Irina Sindler, there's another chapter to it. Because one of the most important stories is nobody knows about Irina. She's a side note to history. But a couple of girls in Kansas, as an assignment for their history class, have to dig into Irina's story. And what they do is they, they basically develop the story. Who is she? Why is she not well known? And I think that's one hard part, because if, if you do something noble, if you stand up for somebody, isn't there a big part of us that wants recognition for that? We want to be recognized for our good work. After the war, towards the end of Irina's service, she is taken prisoner and she is tortured repeatedly for a, for a long period of time. She is eventually, every morning in this prison, they would call out names, and the names they called out were the people who were to be taken out that day and executed. They end up calling Irina's name. And so she you know, goes through the process, she gets on the truck, she's taken to the place where they will be shot, and as everybody else in the group turns right to go to the place of execution, Irina is guided to the left, and the network of people that she worked with had put together a bribe that was big enough that the Germans took it, and that's how her life was spared. But after the war, when the Russians come into Poland and the Russians take over Poland, her story is repressed. So she never gets any recognition for what she has done. And part of that is probably good, 
because if her story is recognized and these children are recognized, at certain points in, in, in history, their lives would be in jeopardy. Well, these girls in Kansas start digging into the story and start developing it. And without ever really meeting Irina, they put together the play, Life in a Jar. And they acknowledge the heroism and the sacrifice that's involved in the story. Now what's interesting is as they put this play on, as they travel around the country and put this play on, different sponsors see it, they're moved by the story, and they start, start offering their financial contributions. And one benefit of this is Irina um, gets a visit from the three girls and their teacher and some others who developed the Life in the Jar story. Through financial support, the three girls can travel to Poland. Um, Irina arranges a tour of Auschwitz. She arranges a tour of the Warsaw Ghetto. She gets the girls um, good historical background and context for what happened. And then she spends several days visiting with them. So when you look at putting, doing what's right, okay, putting action to what is right, how many people are then affected? Because the Life in the Jar program has affected thousands of people across not just the United States but other countries as well. So I want to take a moment and back up just a little bit farther. Last year we had a man come to our school. His name was Carl Wilkins. And Carl made a presentation in the auditorium. He visited with classes throughout the day. Here's a man who in Rwanda in 1994 when the genocide happens and everybody's evacuated, Carl decides to stay behind and to do what he can. So for the hundred days of genocide, Carl stays behind, risking his life to help those that he can help. Orphans, he helps um, deliver water, he helps deliver medical aid, he represents certain groups and tries to protect certain areas, certain uh, neighborhoods. But again, an individual choice. We come this year to Irina's story. This spring, Mrs. Maluli is working hard to bring uh, to our school for several days a man named Drew Kahn. Drew Kahn is the director of the Anne Frank uh, Foundation out of Buffalo, New York. And Drew travels to Rwanda uh, each year with Carl. He takes his drama students from Buffalo, New York, and they go to Rwanda and they develop plays with Rwandan drama students as well. So Drew's going to come here, I think it's the first weekend, um, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in March. We're going to open this up to uh, different groups of people, but if you want to come and partake in the workshop that Drew is offering, he's going to try to teach people how they can put drama to use in expressing concerns they have and facing injustices and helping people. So there's a series of people who are confronting um, the injustices in, in, in the world. Now what's interesting is when you look at today's theme in a sense, the story of the individual, how many individuals surround you? How many individuals do you pass in a day throughout Homestead High School that you truly don't know their story? You see them, you recognize them, you may be friends with them, but you don't totally understand their story. You don't know what happens maybe in their homes or what past experiences they have that makes them who they are. It's important that all of us, teachers and students, um, recognize that we are all individuals that go through different trials, different dilemmas. We, we may celebrate each other's accomplishments and we need to be there for each other in times of trouble. One thing that I find that's interesting is Irina's story was left untold for a number of years until it was discovered. So one question I have about Homestead is how many stories are out there in our student body? How many students in our student body, how many teachers interact in a positive way, somehow contributing to the larger world? And that's one thing that I hope that we can kind of talk about the next four or five weeks. What stories are out there of student success? What stories are out there of students posit positively affecting the world? So many times in the news media we hear stories of the bad. What are the stories of the good? In a couple weeks we're going to talk about that. I told you before I'm going to come back and make a couple more of these videos. Um, I want to talk to you more about the Holocaust, different things that happened, and maybe some examples of when people were bystanders. You know, if you're a bystander and do nothing, are you really doing something? Are you aiding in 
negative attitudes, negative actions. And then what do we do if we want to intervene in those, in those events? How do we do that? Um, so in a couple of weeks, I'll talk to you about something called the Evian Conference in Kristallnacht. I'm going to show you in, in the next lesson about German propaganda. We're then going to look at some of the heroes of the Holocaust and talk about maybe some positive uh, dynamics of what's going on. So right now what you're going to do is you're going to be kind of viewing a, a YouTube video by a name, make, man named Mark Gudgel. And then I'll come back and talk to you for, for a few minutes after that. Um, so education. As a teacher, um, there are a couple of things that I've learned about young people that I think are unequivocally true. The first is that young people are just extraordinarily impressionable. The second is that young people have the capacity and the desire, perhaps more than anyone else, to change the world. So to the first point, young people are impressionable. Uh, I illustrate this in my classes this way, so uh, if you'll humor me, uh, everybody here in the audience, by show of hands, how many of you at one point in your life may have believed that on an annual basis, a six-foot rabbit would lay chocolate eggs in your yard? <laughs> right. You're like, well, it sounds ridiculous when you put it that way. <laughs> it is ridiculous. Um, Let's try again. How many of us in the audience today may have believed at one point in our lives that on an annual basis, an unexplainably altruistic, overweight, jolly man would fly to your house on deer, <laughs> land on the ceiling, climb down the chimney, whether there was a fire going or not, and put presents under your tree, but only if you were well behaved? <laughs> Me too. Me too. So the question I have for teachers, the question I have for parents, the question that I have for our society is this. If we can teach young people to believe heretical lies about religious holidays, <laughs> can we not also teach them to care about one another? Can we not also teach them to serve one another, to see beyond themselves, to lend voices to the voiceless? Can we not teach them that they have a moral obligation to stand up for what's right and to defend those who can't defend themselves? We absolutely can. The second thing that I know about young people is that they have the capacity to change the world. Uh, this is the Nebraska State Capitol building, just in case you're very new here. And um, a lot of amazing things have been done by young people in that building. You know, I think a lot of Americans and, and even a lot of Nebraskans are unaware of this, but the United States of America actually played a part in ending apartheid in South Africa. The United States of America, on a state-by-state -state basis, divested our resources from South Africa in an effort to put economic pressure on them to end their practice of state-sanctioned racism. And it was effective. And so I asked my students, because this was done on a state-by-state -state basis, you know, what, what forward-minded, progressive champion of human rights of a state do you think led that movement? And they always guess California. It puzzles me. <laughs> it was Nebraska. It was Nebraska. That movement was led by a very young senator by the name of Ernie Chambers. Nebraska was the first state in the Union by several years to divest from South Africa. That's something we should be proud of as Nebraskans. But fast forward 30 years, and in this same building, you'd find Ali and Michaela, two former students of mine, and I, pleading with the State Retirement Systems Committee to divest our resources from the Sudan, to try to put pressure on Sudan to end a genocide that they were waging, are waging, against the people of Darfur. Had that bill passed, Nebraska would have been the 28th state in the Union to pass legislation to divest from Sudan. It didn't. And so the question I have for Nebraskans is this. Are you proud of the direction that your state is moving in? Does this represent who we are as people? And if not, voters, what are you going to do about it? The Holocaust lends us the opportunity to study any number of things going on in the world today. The Holocaust itself is a unique watershed event. It's the best documented event in the history of the world. And it ties so closely into things that are happening in our world today. We look at apartheid and racism when we study the Holocaust. We look at anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism didn't begin with the Nazis. It didn't end with the Nazis, but it's rampant in our world today, as is racism, Sexism, homophobia, religious intolerance, all of these are issues, crimes, that were perpetrated by the Nazis and continue to be perpetrated in our world today. And so through the lens of the Holocaust, we examine these things. We study the Holocaust because uh, Holocaust denial is such a huge issue in our world. 
whether it's some kid who didn't get enough attention in his mom's basement on a computer blogging, or the president of Iran, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. There are people in the world today that want to change the narrative, that want to lie about what happened, that want to falsify the facts of what we know took place during the Second World War. And if we don't teach about the Holocaust, they may very well be successful in doing that. We teach about the Holocaust because it links us to any number of other events that have taken place in the 20th century. Holocaust wasn't the first or last genocide of the 20th century. A lot of them still have huge ramifications on the world today. My students and I often find particularly interesting the genocide of Armenians. During the First World War, the Ottoman Empire ruthlessly slaughtered 1.5 million Armenians. And to this day, the government of Turkey denies that that even happened. Not only do they deny it, but they insist that the United States deny it as well. And any time the United States Congress threatens to pass legislation that would even acknowledge their crimes, they throw a fit, yank their ambassador out of Washington, D.C., and threaten to kick us off military bases in their country. And in this way, the nation of Turkey has placed a gag order on the United States of America. Politics are trumping the truth. And there is no better study than that of Nazi Germany to illustrate for young people that politics should never Trump, the truth. We study the Holocaust because in spite of our very best intentions, in spite of our promises of never again, genocide continues to happen in our world today. Since 2003, over half of the six million people who live in the Darfur region of Sudan have either been murdered or forcibly displaced from their homes. And it didn't have to happen. We let it. That's one of the central premises of Holocaust education. The Holocaust was not inevitable. It was not ordained. It was not predetermined. This isn't fate. The Holocaust was not an act of God. The Holocaust was an act of man. And more than that, worse than that, the Holocaust is the failure of man to act. Holocaust education gives us the opportunity to study these things. Young people want to know these things. Young people want to act. Young people like Arcade. It's a great name, isn't it? Arcade, that's really his name. Um, Arcade here is seen speaking with Nessie. Arcade, a friend of mine, is one of the leaders of the Rwandan Genocide Teachers Association. And he's speaking with Nessie Godin, a survivor of the Holocaust. Thanks to our friends at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, my nonprofit organization was able to pipe Nessie in to speak not only to Arcade, but to 29 other Rwandan educators. And she shared with them her story of survival. And they asked her questions, and they made exchanges, and they got to know each other. And these teachers, these people then, were able to take those stories and that information back to their classrooms and share them with their students. This is Holocaust education. This is young people wanting to make a difference. It was taking place in Rwanda. I became interested in Rwanda after Hollywood made a movie about it. And I got furious when I found out about what had happened in Rwanda, partly because I had to find out from a movie. So I have a lot of really vivid memories of 1994. I remember uh, Kurt Cobain killing himself. I remember Nancy Kerrigan, Tanya Harding, O.J. Simpson, there was soccer being played somewhere. I have some memories. In fact, I turned 13 on April the 16th, 1994, 10 days into the genocide. I remember that we celebrated that by eating at Valentino's in North Platte, Nebraska. I remember that I received as a gift that day a Sony Discman. Uh, for all the people with blank stares, that's like a 20-year-old iPod. <laughs> so I have a lot of vivid memories of 1994. What I don't remember is genocide. What I don't remember is anybody even mentioning to me that Somewhere halfway around the world, a million of my fellow human beings were being hacked to death with machetes. It wasn't important enough to talk about, and that made me furious, but it also made me passionate. It inspired me, and I realized as a teacher I had the opportunity to make sure that everybody who came into my classroom didn't leave without that information. And I got really excited about it, and I made it a part of what I do. Today I teach a course called The Literature of the Holocaust. So I had the opportunity in 2008 to travel to Rwanda. And what I learned when I got there was that I had been doing a really, really bad job of teaching about it. See, the problem was this. 
I had defined Rwanda by their worst 100 days. When I got there, I realized how wrong I was. So if you don't take anything else from my talk today, please hear this. Rwanda is not a genocide. It isn't. Rwanda is not a genocide. What happened in Rwanda between April the 6th and July the 17th, 1994, was unequivocally, undeniably genocide. But Rwanda is a nation. Rwanda is a culture. Rwanda is society, history, geography. Rwanda is people like the kids who are kicking my butt in a foot race in this picture. It's people. And so now when I teach about Rwanda, I try to teach those things to my students. I try to teach them and show them that Rwanda is the best cup of coffee I've ever shared with anybody else. That Rwanda is great big smiles, warm handshakes, beautiful singing voices. My students find it particularly interesting. Rwanda has an especially progressive culture. In fact, on a month-to-month -month basis, Rwandans will take uh, three hours out of the last Saturday of the month. They call it Umuganda. It means contribution in Kenya, Rwanda. And they'll find something to do in the neighborhood to help out. Maybe they're repairing or fixing, maybe they're painting, maybe they're building something, cutting firewood, cooking food for somebody. They make a contribution to their society. 10 million people. Imagine what would happen in the United States of America if 315 million people could see far enough beyond themselves to take three hours out of a Saturday to help somebody else. It'd be amazing. Rwanda is such a progressive culture, they've banned plastic bags. They're trash, they can't be gotten rid of, so they just don't use them. The democratically elected parliament in Rwanda is 56% female. It's the only nation in the world that can say that. Just as a point of reference, the democratically elected Congress in the United States of America usually sits right around 17%. So all of these things are Rwanda, and I try to teach them to my students. Rwanda's amazing, but Rwanda's amazing because of the people who live there. When I visited in 2008, I visited a church that in 1994 became the site of a massacre. It's called Ntarama. Ntarama today is a memorial. And on the outside wall of the church hangs this banner. It says, Iyo umenye nawe, ukimenye ntubu waranyishe. If you knew me, and you knew yourself, you would not have killed me. Rwanda, and teaching about Rwanda, gives me the chance to learn more about myself. Gives my students the chance to learn more about the other. To realize that they are so much like us. That we are so much like them. That all of us are human beings. All of us are people. So my friend Drew Bider and I, both having traveled to Rwanda, both having fallen in love with the people and the nation, wanted to make our own Umuganda. We didn't know how to go about it, but as teachers, we realized there was a conversation that was extraordinarily difficult for people to have in Rwanda. See, in the United States, to teach about the Holocaust, I could just point to a textbook and say, turn to page 371 and locate the black and white photographs of what happened in Europe 70 years ago. And that's why I have so much admiration for my colleagues in Holocaust education, because we don't do that, and we try so hard to bridge those gaps. In Rwanda, that simply couldn't be done. In Rwanda, 18 years removed from the genocide, it's a conversation about what your family did to your family. And by the way, where was I when all this was going on? It's a very different, very difficult conversation to have. All right, so you watch the video, the YouTube video, and what I want to do is I want to make some final comments here, and then um, your, your advisory teachers do have a, a sheet of questions that you can discuss. Um, Mark hit some pretty big, pretty big topics. He, he said some, some pretty powerful statements in there. And hopefully your advisory can kind of deconstruct some of those statements. Um, I am going to set up a My Big Campus site. And what I would like is it's, it's baker-jo-advisory-holocaust. And I can email that out to teachers in case you want to join later and don't, don't remember the, the search you have to do. Go there and ask to join and I'll accept you. I'm looking for your feedback. I'm looking for what you're thinking of these presentations that we're doing. I'm, I'm looking for responses from you. If you want to tell me a story um, that you did something positive, if you want to tell me about a friend of yours that did something for which they've not been given any recognition, let's really dig into the student body here. Let's dig into our community 
and highlight the things that we've done that are good, that the, the positive contributions that each of us make. And as we move forward, let's look for those positive contributions. Let's build our own internal network here of students and teachers. What can we do to impact the world? You know, what, what can we do? Like Mark talked about, students making a difference in the world. So let's, let's uncover that. Let's, let's develop uh, a program where we can, we can highlight and share with the community what we're doing here. Um, so if you want to join that, my big campus group, I, I look forward to, to hearing from you. I look forward to your comments, to your feedback. Um, I'll be back next week uh, to talk more. We'll, we'll look at uh, the Evian Conference in Kristallnacht and look at the power of inaction and what could have been done to intervene uh, earlier on. So thank you very much, and I'm going to now turn it over to your advisors who will talk to you about the questions. Thank you.